Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. With each episode, our diverse and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention, together, to breathe, to reflect, and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice that we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. You are going to hear the story today of Maurice Claret, who was a collegiate football star, superstar, who won the national championship, broke the college rushing record, scored the winning touchdown, was on the top of the world, and then completely crashed, ended up in prison and uh, separated from his family and caught up in drugs and all sorts of scandals. And then you're going to hear a little bit about what happens next and what happened after that. It is a story of epic proportions. I mean, it's, it's like a movie. So, Marie, welcome to the show. Uh, welcome. I mean, well, thank you. I say welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. So before we hear about what happened post-college, tell me a little about, about what your life was like growing up. Like, where did you grow up? Who was around? What was it like? You know, how did you kind of get into to football and end up making your way to Ohio State? Well, I come from Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown, uh, for, for everyone who doesn't know, is a very uh, blue-collar area. Still literally ran uh, our town for decades, you know, providing a level of living. Uh, and when Black Monday sort of came, which is uh, the day where you had a bunch of steel mills sort of shut down, uh, the town became very desolate. And I was like in the 1970s. And uh, following that, you know, towards the 80s and 90s, uh, when I grew up, I, grew up my, I was born in 1983. But in uh, in the early 90s, you know, you had a, a huge um, crack epidemic wave. You had a huge violent rave uh, all throughout mm-hmm. the inner city. And it definitely uh, affected the area that I, that I grew up in. And I grew up on a block uh, called Ravenwood. And in the block, it was, uh, you know, a bunch of single plan living, uh, about 40 boys who, who all grew up within the same uh, age range of one another, uh, within a, you know, three to five year age range. And it was just a, a, a very competitive, aggressive, um, uh, but but fun-filled uh, childhood growing up, you know, and, and a lot of what takes place uh, in inner cities, you know, around America, just as a young town of Howard, Chicago, or, 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 or somewhere, and, and Florida, mm-hmm. California, or somewhere. Uh, but what a lot of takes, what, what takes place a lot amongst kids, and I'll speak in retrospect, is that, uh, you know, the, the kid who gets in trouble or the kid who, uh, does the most violent things, you know, seems to get all the respect and, you know, or the kid who sells the most drugs, you know, these guys, these guys seem mm-hmm. to garner more respect from, you know, other individuals. And so and if someone of us at a young age to see it all through my neighborhood, uh, I caught myself gravitating towards uh, the activities of doing uh sort of stupid things or, or, or things that would be, would be deemed irresponsible now, uh, but were cool to my neighborhood then, you know, and uh, I spent a lot of time uh, playing sports, but also, I spent a lot of time being a knucklehead. And uh, what really started happening when I was a, when I was a child, like I had my mother was in my life. Uh, you know, she worked at this place called Neil UConn, uh, Northeast Ohio University College of Medicine. And uh, she would go to work every morning about 7.30, and she would get home every night uh, between 7.30 and 8 o'clock. And what would happen, you know, my dad wasn't in the picture, so what would happen is that um, me and my brother would go to school, and when we, when we, when we would come home from school, uh, it was just basically all of the kids in the neighborhood were raising each other. You know what I'm saying? And um, right. so be it, uh, around 10 or 11 years old, I got incarcerated for the first time. You know, the first time I got incarcerated, uh, I stole a car, went on a joyride, and uh, lo and behold, wow. uh, I ended up uh, getting incarcerated. You know, I spent about two or three days in the juvenile wow. institution, came back home. Uh, and when I came back home, I was like, you know, so happy and so glad that, you know, this, this stuff I took place in my life. You know, I went to jail and I was like, you know, the rites of passage and, you know, I was considered to be cool at that time. So the second part or the second uh, thing that happened, uh, you know, I got out of, I got out of jail, uh, came back to society living, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the cool guys amongst the cool guys. And, uh, uh, maybe about a month later, I got into a fist fight with some guys from another side of town. I was about 11 or 12 years old. And I was real big for my age and you know, I was probably about five, 10 at the time. Uh, you know, I like probably 180 pounds and you know, I was real big as a kid. And uh, I ended up going back to the juvenile hall, but, but, but when this time I went, uh, they sent me to about 30 days and I spent, you know, 30 days in the institution. Uh, and I thought like, you know, Hey, I'm a little bit cooler now. Like I'm tough. I'm hard. You know, I have this, uh, this juvenile jail persona around me. And I thought like, this was like a, a cool deal. And this was like, after my brothers had went and I felt like, you know, I was just one of the gang. And uh, I didn't really realize that, uh, you know, I was just kind of leading my life in a different direction. 
And so uh, after that, they, they brought me up to Institute 10. Uh, my mother uh, uh, tried to get me in like, you know, AAU basketball and track and other activities uh, to try to occupy my time. I love the sport uh, right. very much, but I also love the attention from uh, anything that went on in the streets. Even as a kid, I just used to love that attention or that acceptance from, you know, the guys who were in my neighborhood. And so I stayed out of trouble maybe for a year or two. And the last time that kind of really changed my life and got me into football full-time, uh, I was like, uh, I went to go break in, into an individual's house. And as we, as we broke in, uh, there was a gentleman uh, leaving inside the house. And he woke up, he came out. And as he came out, uh, he seen us, you know, rummaging through his things. And he, he, he runs down the hallway, runs down the steps, and shuts himself in a room. And, uh, you know, I'm running to try to get out the house. And I jump through the window, a uh, second-story window, Bust my head on the um, kind of slither uh, down the uh, the side of the house. I bust my head on the ground, uh, jump over the fence, and, you know, I'm tripped up and blood is everywhere. And uh, lo and behold, I'm like, wow, you know, this was uh, kind of crazy. Uh, but eventually I ended up getting caught. And so before I got caught, you know, I went, I had uh, 13 staples in my hand. And, uh, you know, I went back um, to the juvenile facility. And I'm thinking to myself, like, man, you know, this time I'm going to uh, the juvenile prison, which was in Columbus, Ohio. And that's where, like, all the kids uh, from around the state who uh, were required to go to, like, the state institution, the detention facility, that's where these kids were kind of headed to. And so, uh, make a long story short, uh, the judge had agreed to allow this gentleman, uh, who was a correctional officer named Mr. Roland Smith, she allowed him to kind of interject into what was going on. And so, Mr. Roland had came to me about, like, 2 o'clock in the morning, I believe, uh, when he was working. I was like, man, you know, what are you doing? You know, you're messing up your life. Uh, you know, I know your mother, I know your father, you know, you're not supposed to be in this situation. And, uh, Lord, like just in, in retrospect, he was speaking life and said, you know, he was speaking more of my life and, right. Longer, you know, what I could become and what I could be doing with all the sides, you know, uh, ripping, running, jumping and, and, and getting in trouble. And so he said, I'm going to see if the judge allows me to put you on house arrest. And, uh, if she can, I want to kind of like be your mentor and help you get into football and just add, uh, some positive male structure. So. I agreed to it, uh, obviously, because I didn't want to go to jail. Uh, the judge agreed to it because she saw the benefit of him basically like being and taking that role over me. And the next thing you know, we just started to uh, move forward. And so throughout the summertime, I would go back and forth to uh, workouts. I would be getting in shape and you know, I would come home and spend my time at home because I had one of those ankle monitors on when you know, I was um, you know, being at home throughout the summer. And it was, it was healthy for me. It was healthy for me to be in that environment and then also go back home. And so... Uh, going to get my freshman year now, uh, this kind of like, this is how everything sort of burst up. High school or college? Yeah, high school. Uh, and so when I come through, I come to my freshman year at high school, uh, I go to a school called Austin Town Fitch, and I had no idea of, like, how good I was. Uh, I just thought, like, you know, I was good in my own hometown, but amongst other guys and kids who were three, four years older than me, you know, I thought these kids were, like, like, uh, like, like way beyond um, the, my level of talent there. And so I got here, and lo and behold, on my first three or four games, I ended up starting on the varsity team, and I had a tremendous amount of success in about three or four weeks, uh, a, a few hundred mm. yard games, a couple two hundred yard games, and I just had really made an impact in the town that we were playing. And so I, I hurt my ankle in the process, and uh, when I hurt my ankle, you know, I just had a chance to kind of look at it like, man, you know, I don't have to go back to the ne neighborhood no more. Uh, I can actually go to college. You know, it wasn't anything from an academic standpoint, but it was like, man, if I really take football serious, if I really lift weights, if I really spread, if I really get in shape, if I really, you know, do that, I can obviously, you know, do something with my life. And so the whole uh, fascination with the neighborhood was just gold. You know, it was just like there was a new, if there was something new to do, and it was like a cool You had a new vision. New vision. And so that, that same thing, I have to ninth grade, um, I'm in the middle of my grade, you know, I transferred to a school called Warren Harding. Uh, and that was because they were, they were, uh, sending guys to more elite division one level schools. Uh, and they historically did it. And so, uh, year two had happened, year three had happened. Uh, and going into my senior year, I had traveled the country and had seen guys playing. And, uh, there was like just a, uh, a conflict that came over me. And I was like, when I start seeing these guys do stuff, I was like, man, like, I'm not just one of the best guys in my area or one of the best guys in the state, like, in my heart. And it was it was spoken from a level of confidence and not cockiness. I said, I'm better than all these guys across the country. And it was just how I felt about myself and in my heart, you know, just a, like a supreme confidence. And uh, I go out my senior year, we win a bunch of games, and win the national player of the year. And the next thing you know, I'm heading off to uh, to college. 
So I graduate early, I go to college, and, uh, you know, that whole process starts over again. It's like, okay, can I do this again? I was a big man on campus when I left my high school. Right. Uh, but do you have what it takes to do this at the collegiate level? Mm-hmm. And uh, I yeah. found myself um, working so much uh, out of fear, you know what I'm saying? Like, because I want to perform yeah. the same way that I performed yeah. in high school. Uh, so I have to live every way and I have to make every meet. I have to watch every video. I have to do everything. But there was nothing um, that I felt I had to do uh, from a characteristic standpoint, from a behavioral standpoint, or even from an academic standpoint. Mm-hmm. Those things were uh, were totally neglected. Everything in my neighborhood is animalistic. Everything is primitive. Every Everything is, if we have a problem, let's fight. Or if we want to uh, do something, everything is physical. They, they, you, you have to have no intellect uh, to, to navigate most inner city. Everything is thick shoe mm-hmm. and things of that nature. And so to a large part, sports is that way. You know, there's not a lot of thinking. There's a lot of like reaction and, 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 and tenacity and attitude and approach and, and, and just things that you work on naturally come to the forefront. And just, you know, and a lot of the stuff I'm speaking in retrospect, but there's no, like at that moment, there was no nothing for me to identify my life that you needed character for something else. You know what I'm saying? It was just straight, mm-hmm. let me just be a beast, let me lift weight till this, let me get on the football field. And we go through the uh, entire off season and two weeks before the season, I ended up gaining the starting position. And this was like a big deal for our state. You know, uh, they had a, a long legacy of Eddie George and Robert Smith and Archie Griffith and, uh, you know, long, just a tremendous amount of talent uh, before me and to, to reach that, that position as a freshman. Uh, it was a big deal. And so, you know, we come on the scene and in my first game, I'm, I'm nervous as heck. You know, I don't sleep the night before. I'm thinking like Mac, and I actually do this, and I go out the first game, and I run for 175 yards, and like it was a big deal. Uh, I had success in practice, but I was like, you know, can you transfer that thing uh, to the uh, to the football field? And so, uh, lo and behold, and I, and I said all that, uh, and, I, and I know I know I said a lot during the uh, during the beginning part, but but it all brings context to to everything that I'm about to talk about now. Yeah. So tell me, what is it like to win the national championship? Phenomenal on the field, uh, all the accolades, all of the attention, uh, to be able to go inside of a, uh, a, a grocery store or a, uh, uh, or, or a CVS or Walmart or whatever you want to call it and to be able to see your face on a magazine to, to, to start something out with guys as a vision in the side of a locker room and, and you have common goals and a lot of the games that we were winning were very close and, you know, guys sort of, uh, uh, enjoying that. That was like the most phenomenal thing. Uh, but one thing that became a lapse or one thing that became a hindrance to me was that uh, the little kid who never grew up uh, and only became good in football, he started to, uh, to emerge uh, the more famous I became. So the same little kid who was getting locked up, the same little kid who enjoyed uh, just, just miscellaneous sex and miscellaneous attention and miscellaneous uh, activity with everything, that kid started to emerge the more famous he became. Mm-hmm. And all of the fame, uh, I, I didn't have the skill or the character to store it. You know what I'm saying? And so when it came and it happened, uh, I didn't realize I was out of control. And I didn't realize that I was just acting uh, without a level of humility. And and, 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 it, and it soon burst. You know what I'm saying? So we go out. We win the national championship. Uh, at this time, uh, LeBron stays about 30 minutes away from me when I stayed in Youngstown. And he's on his uh, meteoric, meteoric rise uh, in Akron and, you know, every chance I get on running back up and down a freeway to see him play basketball, um, uh, at their, uh, at their arena. And it's just crazy. You know, he's sending me shoes and, and jogging suits and, 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 and t-shirts and everything and Adidas, Nike, and everybody wanted him at this time. And it was like a phenomenal time. I remember, you know, going on tour at 50 Cent and Jay-Z and, and Fabulous and Snoop Dogg. And this was just like the craziest thing. Uh, in my life, and I'm a 19 year old kid, you know, so, so my personal wow. reality or uh, what a college sophomore should be at this time was totally jaded, you know, like totally jaded. And so, um, at the end of the uh, season, at the end of the, uh, the spring, I headed to my second year, uh, the NCAA came in and they said, Hey, Maurice, uh, we would like to investigate you for things that haven't been taking place. And I thought my heart was like, Man, there's no way that uh, even the school will allow me to be suspended because. You know, I'm worth so much to the program. Uh, but lo and behold, they found 125 violations. They suspend me uh, indefinitely. Uh, and at that point, you know, th- that's when, like, the mental collapse came in. And this was, like, like mental health and, and mental health issues and depression and things that you have never uh, dealt with. These things, like, came to the forefront of my brain. 
And so, um, like, you know, when, when you're going through something from a, from a, uh, from a physical standpoint in football, you can just either watch more film and lift weight till you get how to get better in that. But, but when you're going through a depression or when you're sleeping two hours a night, uh, or when you're getting up every day, just always thinking negative about something you don't realize or understand, uh, how to even combat that, deal with that. Who do you talk to? How do you deal with it the whole night? And I found myself a lot of times either, uh, going back out to the nightclubs I was going to, uh, hang out at getting drunk, going to have sex with women, doing everything to occupy myself or to distract myself from me basically being depressed. And so two, a year I went by, uh, I tried to challenge the NFL for early entry. That didn't help. They rejected me. I ended up going to California and I went to California just to get away from Ohio and try to get away from every distraction that I had. Uh, but the lifestyle, the culture of Los Angeles was completely different uh, from Columbus, Ohio. You know, and I'm out of football for a couple of years or so. Uh, it didn't do anything, but just, you know, it, it compounded the situation. And to make a long right. story short, over uh, over two years, uh, I spent a lot of time just partying and having fun uh, when I was supposed to be preparing for football. But football just seemed like it was never coming back around. I was also depressed. So uh, I, I come to the NFL Combine two years later. I'm preparing, and I fail horribly at the Combine. And so I'm thinking to myself, mm. like, man, I'm not going to get drafted. Like, there's no way this is going to happen for me. You know, I've been out of football for two years. I performed horribly at the combine. I'm not in the greatest shape anymore. And just my heart just wasn't into the game. It was just like, you know, I got beat up so much just from media stuff and the ups and downs and just the, the rigor of going through uh, something very public. And so I was like, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just watch the draft when it comes on out of curiosity. So the draft comes on, uh, first two rounds come on, and I'm seeing guys getting drafted and going up on the stage and families crying and all that stuff. And uh, this was actually making me more depressed because I was like just thinking like, man, that's supposed to be me. And so uh, we go uh, forward and, you know, the ball's kind of rolling down the uh, road. First round goes by, second round goes by. I get in the car, I'm riding around uh, the 405 and uh, Denver calls me. Denver calls me and they say, hey, Maurice, you know, we would love to uh, bring you out to make you Bronco. Uh, congratulations. You know, uh, you know, the plane tickets, you know, be there tomorrow. So I'm like, man, you know, the plane tickets will be here tomorrow. Life is great. Uh, you know, I can't mm -hmm. wait, uh, get out there, pumped up on the left hand, but then on the right hand, I'm like, I know for a fact I'm not prepared. I think anybody who even listens to this, you know, some, some of us have been given opportunities that we know inherently or in, innately that we're not prepared to, uh, to steward. And the next thing you know, at some point, the wheels will fall off on this thing. So I got out to Denver. I was out of shape and, and the altitude didn't make it any worse. And, and one thing I didn't know, I didn't know how, how to get to Denver. And so the combination mm -hmm. of all of that, you know, me being out of shape, uh, me having every bad habit you could possibly name, me having bad character, uh, all those things were just beginning to surface. So like midway through camp, uh, Coach Shanahan calls me over and said, man, Maurice, you know, I know you had a tough time before you got here. And I know, you know, we would like to help you and support you. And they tried to pair me with a uh, sports psychologist. And so for me, I was like, man, I don't want a sports psychologist. Like, you know, what, what, what is it going to help me to talk to this lady? You know what I'm saying? It just totally blew her off. And so we kept going on inside the season and they tried to approach me again with the woman. And so she set me down and she was trying to figure out what was going on. And I just rejected her again and said, Hey lady, I don't want anything to do with you. Uh, not in a real way, but it's like, you know, I'm cool. I don't want to do this. You know, I didn't feel comfortable talking to her. And so, you know, the next thing you know, uh, the preseason comes around. I don't get in the games. They kick me off the team and then I'm back out. Uh, to California, you know, as, as a rejected uh, free agent. And so now uh, I circle back. I come to Ohio. When I get back to Ohio, I'm even more depressed. I'm isolated. Uh, not just, just not social, not really know where to pick up the pieces at. And I found myself right back into the streets, you know, right running around, hustling, selling drugs, robbing people. And eventually that led to a, a robbery case in downtown Columbus on New Year's Eve of 2005. Um, a, a few weeks after that, uh, literally a few weeks after that, I found out uh, that my lady I'm with now, we're still together. Uh, she was pregnant with our daughter, and uh, and she's mm -hmm. pregnant with the daughter. I'm kicked out of the NFL. I'm kicked out of college. And just like everything was just like boom, boom, bam, you know, uh, down the slippery slope of depression. And uh, nine months after that, that was like when the big arrest had happened on TV. Uh, I got into a high-speed chase uh, with the uh, with the police officers when they tried to pull me over, and they caught me uh, with a bunch of guns and a bulletproof vest on. And at that point, everything in my life, uh, and eventually stopped, you know, and everything that I was doing, uh, was kind of shut down. And I knew I got arrested and was driving downtown to the, uh, courthouse. I was like, you know, it's over, you know, I'm, I'm, I'll be in prison. It's not like, uh, your mother can't come and get you. 
Yeah, your uh, your, your, your coach can't come and get you. This is like the principal's office. You come to ask, uh, this is the real deal. Mm-hmm. Oh, I ended up going downtown to the prison. And uh, when I got down there, they set me in the county jail. And the irony of all this is that the judge was like, hey, we're not going to start a trial or uh, any level of our proceedings until you get a mental health evaluation. And so I went to go get a mental health evaluation. I get diagnosed with uh, anxiety and depression. Uh, and uh, after that, you know, I was waiting for court. Uh, they sit me inside of a cell, like a nine by four cell, uh, for 23 hours of the day, uh, no windows, pure isolation. You got 20 minutes to go uh, take a shower inside of another cell, another 20 minutes to use the phone if you're able to uh, afford the phone call, and another 20 wow. minutes at that point to, um, for recreation to go from one cell uh, to another cell. That was just like, you know, just, just horrible, you know. And I spent that time like that for uh, for seven months. And so, you know, after all of that isolation, all that lockdown, you know, they finally shipped me to the prison. I'm sentenced to seven and a half years. And uh, it was like a blessing from God happened uh, on my second day uh, when I was there. And so uh, I, I got there my second day. I was called down to a central office and the warden of the prison, his name was uh, Mr. Keller Conte. Uh, Mr. Keller Conte is probably one of the most beautiful individuals I've ever met in my life. And the spirit is like, you know, none other. And uh, he said, hey, Maurice, you know, my son's the same age. And uh, he's like, you know, in life, we, you know, we make mistakes or bad choices. And uh, he was like, you know, he was like, uh, the police don't catch criminals. Criminals catch themselves. They just don't know how to stop. Oh, I just remember him saying that, mm-hmm. right? And uh, he was like, uh, he was, what, what he, what, essentially what he said, he was like, my father well, used to be the chief of Sierra Leone. And he said, when well, guys would get in trouble in Sierra Leone, uh, he would bring them closer, figure out what's going on, repair them, uh, and send them back so they could be better people. And he said, but in America, when guys get in trouble, we just happen to throw them away and, uh, and put them in a system where we just keep throwing them away. And he said, and so what he told me, he was like, I'm going to give you a bunch of coursework to do while you're here. Uh, and if you accept it, it's on you. And if you don't, you know, it's on you as well. And essentially what the coursework was, it was a bunch of psychosocial rehabilitative services. And so I was like, you know, I agree. You know, I had to do four years mandatory. Uh, I was like, man, I've been wrecking my head into uh, the, uh, the wall for the last three or four years or two or two or three years. Like, I just knew I needed some assistance with my life. And so the next thing you know, I uh, start going back and forth to these courses every day. So you would get up at 8 in the morning. Uh, your first class may be at 8.30, and you probably wouldn't get back to the dormitory or to the housing unit until about like 4.35. It was like a regular job of some sorts, right? And so after a while, you get to uh, spend the time around different guys and you get to have a conversations about anger management and responsible adult culture and uh, thinking for change and uh, the uh, five languages or seven lang- love languages. And you start to have uh, classes that help you to develop or, or speak into different parts of yourself that you've never spoken into. You start to realize that there was more inside of you this whole time. You just never had, had the space or a chance to explore it. And so from there, I would think mm-hmm. back, I felt like, you know, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do with your life? Like you can't play football. You'll get out of prison. You know, if you're lucky at 28, but if you're not lucky, uh, you'll get out like at 32 or something like that. And I said, you know, forget this, man. I gotta, I gotta get my life in order. And so I like, what I went like into this football ball and I said, okay, when I wanted to play football and learn how to be better, like I did nothing. And I mean, absolutely nothing, but just watch video after video after video of great people. So I said, man, if I want to be great in life, I just got to study from great businessmen or investors or, or people who are just successful. So I went on just this whole tangent of just reading anything I got my hands on. Uh, anytime I see a magazine, you know, I will put my hands on and I start, you know, just getting money from different people uh, who were supportive of me during my incarceration and, you know, everything from fortunate Forbes and economists and, uh, 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 the Econ- economist was one of my best favorite magazines and, uh, it, like Inc. and, and a 300 and every, everything you possibly in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, uh, or right. Cater, the Columbus Dispatch, everything I would just have coming into my sale. And then there was a thing called Bargain Book. The Bargain Book allows you to order books for like three or four bucks. And I would just like to order 15 books at a time. And so there was so much isolation in prison that all you had to do was just sit and read. And I, that's why you see when guys come out of prison, they're well read. is because like when you're isolated, you sit down so much in a cell, you literally have nothing to do. You just read and write, read, 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 write. Mm. I, I just got into that habit, you know, over four years. You know, there's no party on the weekends or let's go out and hang out with the family after dinner. It's like intense training. You don't have to have. So right. you're, you're physically getting together. You're mentally getting together. And after about uh, two years, I began to eat some of the classes that I went through. And so, uh, you know, after four years of becoming like a model, uh, like I said, a model, a model prisoner, uh, if that isn't a thing, uh, and I don't want to say a leader because there's a lot of men 
uh, who are a lot tougher than me in prison, but to become a well-respected gentleman a bunch, uh, among a bunch of gentlemen, uh, you know, it was, it was easy to see that I had my stuff together, I mind my business, and I, and I handle my business. And so uh, for the most part, they let me out after four years. I got out. I went back to Ohio State uh, for a summer school course. And when I, when I go back in the midst of that, uh, there was a gentleman who called me um, the old uh, the old Denver Broncos uh, general manager, Ted Sanquist. He had called me back to play in a minor league uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. So I go out to Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, I had like the time of my life when I was out there. I was just like enjoying life and playing football again. And I was doing it because I was broke and I, you know, I needed the money. My little girl was poor at the time. And, you know, obviously I need to be able to provide for her and get the furniture for the house and a vehicle and all that other stuff that, you know, I just didn't have. And uh, I'll tell you one, one cool story that happened to me when I was out there. Now, when I was in prison, uh, they talk about the law of attraction. Some people believe it's phony and some people believe it's real. But I'll tell you just one thing that happened to me. Uh, when I was in prison, I think I, I think I know Warren Buffett's entire life from A to Z uh, as it is written. Mm-hmm. Uh, our coach, uh, when we were in Omaha, Nebraska, my second year, uh, his name was Joe Moglia. And Joe Moglia was like, uh, the CEO for uh, TD Ameritrade for about eight years. But he had stepped down in, uh, 2000 and I want to say nine or eight, uh, from being the chairman of the board. I'm mean, from being the active CEO and then to be the chairman of the board. And, uh, he became a football coach, which I thought was very interesting, you know, to make all that money and then just say, Hey, I want to go coach football. So he ended up landing, uh, in Omaha, Nebraska and coaching our team. And so one day he was like, hey, Maurice, you know, I think your story is kind of interesting. Uh, how about you meet me at the golf course? And so I'm like, all right, cool. You know, we're going to meet at the golf course. And um, when I go to the golf course, he just was like this, like, tell me a story. And so we're just chatting back and forth. And, and throughout the uh, process of us chatting, he's like, hey, how about you do this? He was like, uh, uh, tell me, like, you know, what was the reform like in prison? And I told him, like, that one person I was very fascinated with and in life in general uh, which is the warm buff and, and his level of humility with all of what he had. And he was like, you know what? Uh, warm buff. It's a good friend of mine. Let me see if he'll meet you. Something in myself like, man, wow. We yeah. had, but I'm 18 months removed from prison. Like <laughs> warm buff. don't want to meet me, my man. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, I was like, uh, all right, cool. Like, you know, whatever. And so I kind of blew him off. And, uh, next thing I know it was a Wednesday walking to my apartment and uh, my phone rings and like, even from seeing him on Charlie Rose so much, so did he uh, act like, hey, can I speak to Maurice? And I'm like, uh, speaking. He's like, hey, it's Warren. He's like, uh, he said, Joe told me yeah. that you want to meet me. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he was like, uh, yeah. He was like, uh, when do you have time? He was like, do you have anything going on on Saturday? And I was like, man, if I did, it's canceled. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. And so, like, so I was like, I went to, uh, you know, I didn't have any money. So I, I went to, uh, like, TJ Maxx or Marcus or something. And he's like, I got my best clothes. I'm like, yo, you're like, you know, I, I, I thought like, you know, I'm going to spend all I can on that outfit because I got to get a picture. You got to look good. And so I went mm-hmm. down to, uh, I went down to the Kiwi building. And, uh, I, when I go, when I get over there, uh, I come in and, uh, uh an appointment, just kind of show you how God works in your life, uh, an appointment that he was, uh, about to do, they canceled on him. And so when I came up there, we just always be shake a hand, take a picture and roll out. And so uh, I had my family with me. He was like, hey, you know, I was like, hey, do you mind if I, uh, uh, he was like, hey, do you, do you, uh, do you want to stay in chat? Because my appointment was, uh, go on. And I said, don't want to stay in chat. I'm like, absolutely. Like, you know what I'm saying? Let's go. Wow. We sat there. He was like, you know, Maurice, you know, uh, he was like, you know, I uh, talk a lot. You know, I was like, I don't mind listening. You know what I'm saying? And so for like four hours, just going back and forth with him, uh, unscripted, just straight freestyle and, you know, just hanging out with the man. Beautiful moment in my life, my man. And, uh, and I was cool, but, you know, just kind of jump back into like the, the, the main story, uh, after being in Omaha for two years, the league that we were in and had shut down. And, uh, and after that, um, there was a, uh, what is it called? There was a probation or a clause in my probation that required me to be in Omaha to play football because I had five years upon my release. And then they shifted me back to Ohio. And when I came back to Ohio in the, in the interim of that, uh, you had, he appeared, reach out and say, Hey, we would like you to do a 30 for 30 in your life. And, you know, I didn't know what a 30 for 30 was. And then they reached out. We agreed, uh, uh, to, to the video. And basically we shot it over like the next eight months. And, and one day, uh, when it came out, uh, my email, my, I didn't even know what Facebook was. You know, I didn't even, like, I didn't even know how to go in and look at stuff. I didn't know what a fan page, regular stuff was. So I barely knew how to work an email, but it just kind of blew up overnight. And I had, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, to come and speak, and you know, I wasn't even prepared to speak, and I was just trying to get my life in order. 
And so uh, he was like, hey, can you come and tell your story? And I'm like, I don't even know how to tell it, but I'll try. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe even if you just ask me questions, I'm like, we'll, we'll all right there. And, uh, and so wow. next thing you know, I just got on the plane and, and I, I learned how to speak on the fly. And I got around the country and I got in front of people's faces with, uh, you know, just uh, from different businesses to churches to uh, youth organizations to collegiate football teams and basketball teams and track teams and uh, recovery centers and anything that you could possibly think of. And I'm pretty sure I can speak to, you know, 70 to 80 times a year, you know, the, the various venues and the places that, you know, some people may not realize, you know, that's out there uh, that you're able to speak at. And you know, I just kind of right. on faces. And, uh, you know, like after, after about three years, uh, it kind of beat me up, you know, so I, so I, one, I applaud you for having the stamina to travel that much. But for me, it was beating me up. I was like, yo, I'm never home. Uh, my daughter's growing up. I just spent three years in prison and to just spend three years in prison, didn't get back on the road for three years, just be gone, you know, four days a week. Right. Yes. Very hard, you know, very, very hard. So I say, you know, I studied entrepreneurship when I was in prison. Uh, I really, uh, you know, I, you know, I had a chance, you know, I was very fortunate, very fortunate. Uh, to be able to get paid just to speak, which I think is, you know, I think it's like crazy. You paid to speak. And, um, you know, they, uh, they, 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 uh, they paid me and I was, you know, I was sitting on, uh, some money I was able to, uh, invest into some trips. I was like, you know, transportation is a relatively easy industry to understand. And I also got into some real estate. And so I, I started letting those things grow and build and, and create the residual income for myself. And, uh, and I got into the packaging business from the transportation business and, you know, things just started to grow. And uh, one thing happened, I went to uh, a, a youth organization, a youth organization, a youth, uh, whatever it's called, like symposium. And they had a bunch of student athletes here. And it's kind of like changed my life into the space I'm in now. And I finally think that I'm in my life's work. And I really feel that way. Uh, but I was speaking at a youth organization and these people had a breakout session. And uh, in the breakout session, there was a gentleman uh, who uh, was presenting something that I basically was teaching in prison. And I really got the material from another uh, book that I had got, but on a thing called the AMBC, uh, the Activate Event, the Mind Activity, the Body Reaction, the Consequences. And it was basically teaching kids cognitively how to process information or conflict or, or just whatever it was going on in their lives. And I was like, hey, my man, you know, I used to teach this when I was in prison. Like, do you mind if I engage with the kids? I just enjoy teaching. And um, next thing you know, uh, we're sitting there, we're going through the uh, the lesson or the lecture. And after we were over, I was like, my man, like, you know, what do you do? And he was like, you know, I, I own a uh, behavioral health agency. And so at that time, I never knew what a behavioral health agency was. I was like, you know, but I was like, uh, this is the platform to to engage with people. And I know it's a platform because I remember when I went down to uh, what it was, LSU, and I remember speaking to Litter Fortnite after we were done. I don't know why. I think it was just because it was health. And, and it was like the magnitude of it. And the year before that was Derrick Henry when he played at uh, Alabama. Uh, but all these young guys, they would come up to me and it was like, you know, like, I understand where you're at, but how do I get from where I'm at to where you're at? And, uh, it's like never just one, it's like, it's not one book. It's not one, uh, not just one thing at the process of you continuously working on your mind and working on your mm. body and everything else. And I just was like, yo, this is the stuff that kind of changed my life in prison over a period of time. And I thought that it was cool that I, there was a vehicle out here, uh, to deliver, uh, information like this. And, uh, you know, uh, and I went from there. And to make a long story short, I got with an agency or got with the company uh, to help me develop uh, my policies and procedures and things that I wanted to do uh, within my agency. And over, you know, probably I think started October 15th when we started uh, sitting down and developing this work. And then June of 2016, uh, we opened our doors up and, and we went back to the Youngstown community. And I, I intentionally went back into these neighborhoods and, and back to dealing with these schools and kids. Uh, that I basically had, had dealt with. And we, we also do mental health for adolescents and adults, uh, but we also deal with uh, our recovery. You know, we have, we're, we're, part, we're partly a mental health agency and part of a treatment facility. And so uh, we started going back into these schools and, you know, we work with probably about 300 families right now. Uh, we have about 27 employees. We do direct services in school, after school, uh, a bunch of family counseling and just a bunch of cool stuff uh, where we engage with the man. Uh, we, uh, we do a bunch of outpatient services with adults. We house about 30 men, uh, about 15 women. Uh, and we just help these people who happen to be in recovery, uh, affected by either alcohol or opioid epidemic or, or anything, uh, that end their life, uh, things that basically affected me personally. And this work is sort of like near and dear to my heart. Uh, that's sort of my life, you know, uh, uh, it's sort of like, like sort of like what I have going on. Uh, and I really like, you know, it's just been a journey and it's, it's kind of like, um, 
or thing you go through uh, prior uh, to it's where you're in life, it kind of teaches you and helps you or propel you to the uh, to the next. Well, Maurice, I uh, wanted people to hear this story because it blew me away. And is it fair to say that personal development had a pretty dramatic change on shaping, reshaping your life? I mean, it, it is the essence of the change in my life. And it, it's the essence of our, our agency is called the Red Zone. It's the essence of what we do. It's all personal development. If, 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 like it, you know, school, school teaches you, it gives you instruction, it teaches you like, um, like specific skills, specific areas, you know, but, but being able to apply what you know, being able to, to, to pump yourself up, being able to stay disciplined, being able to stay in the right frame of mind, being able to engage with others and all the other skills that you get from building, uh, or just going through personal development, um, uh, material in general is the, is the, is the cornerstone of my change. I will personally believe in all psychosocial rehabilitative services are is nothing more, nothing more than just personal development. It just, ha- it, it just, being brought in a clinical way. I do have one other question. And and before I do, you know, I wanted to ask you too, like, where do you want people to go to kind of learn more about you and connect with you? And if they they want to connect with me, they can do uh, mauriceclaret.com and I'll have everything for me personally. Yeah, Maurice, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for sharing your story. And most of all, thank you for making such a dramatic turnaround in your life. Thank you, my friend. Well, here we go. Thank you. And I heard this before I go, God only uplifts you it puts you in position to uplift others. And my life, nothing more, nothing less, isn't about me. It's about basically people putting uh, me in position, or God put me in position to be in a position to uplift others. So everything is all good. Uh, I can't complain, uh, but thank you again. Thank you for having me. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. And to stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and on Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. And thanks for listening.